Well, it's great to be here. This demonstrates what everybody knows. Television's still the one thing that can draw an audience. So it's good that you're here. So let's get started. Uh, we saw some of the work I do, we saw in 1975 in most of the developed world, people spent 16 hours a week in front of a screen. Last year, it was 47 hours. And we think it'll be close to 60 hours in the next five to eight years. But 1975, 16 hours, those were all 16 hours on the screen, in the home, on a schedule, television. The 47 hours are now on three, or depending on how you count tablets, four screens. The world is changing. In the work I do tracking people globally, we found one of the most interesting audiences to study, and we didn't know this when we started, were college students who just graduated and were getting their first apartments or houses. And that's when they had to decide which things they grew up with they were willing to pay for and which things they weren't. And that's where 14 years ago we saw they weren't getting landline telephones. And it was pretty clear what was going to happen to landline phones, and it has. That's where we saw they weren't subscribing to printed newspapers. And it was clear what ultimately was going to happen to the printed newspaper. Three years ago, we saw they weren't getting cable or satellite television. And in the last year, we've seen they aren't even getting television sets. But that's not lack of interest in television. Their interest in television is greater than any generation we've seen. They just watch on different devices in different ways, nonlinear, and the whole way in which television is reaching its consumers is changing. I think television, the line I use, is television's at the tipping point again. HBO just went over the top in the first country other than the Nordic countries. We think lots of television's going to go over the top, changing the economics and the distribution. We think the only thing that matters anymore is content. And through social media, people know how to find good content. I grew up in Hollywood where the mantra was content is king. I would argue today, pardon the incorrect grammar, content is kinger than it has ever been. And we've even seen that the line between film and television is changing. Film used to be the high status medium that the big stars went to. And now today, some of the biggest stars in the world, the Kevin Spaceys, the Matt Damons, the Michael Douglases, are now more interested in television than they are in film for a variety of reasons. So I've been gifted with this great panel. That's enough of me. Let's get started and let's really get into some questions. And the format is I'm going to have a short conversation individually with each of our four panelists. And then we'll join together in a conversation and hopefully find some disagreement as well as agreement. And then we'll open it up to the audience. So let me start. I'm not going to go down the row, because I wasn't sure ahead of time where anybody was going to sit anyway. But let me start near, in the middle, on, the, on your right middle, with uh, Jean-Philippe Jean Mehou, if I, or I've been taught how to say that, or JP, who's the Managing Director, Global Brands and Agency Strategy at Twitter. At Twitter, he leads the agency brands and is integrally involved in Twitter's overall television strategy. He joined Twitter when they were acquired, when, when Twitter acquired Bluefin in 2013, where he was the CEO, and he's also been the CEO at Razorfish in the early days. JP, it's great to have you here. So Twitter, when Twitter, when Twitter first emerged, it was the silliest thing I had ever seen. 140 characters to tell people what you had for lunch yesterday. Now Twitter is transforming television, along with a lot of other things we've heard about the Arab Spring, how it's changed customer service. How did this 140 character phenomenon become this thing that's transforming the world of television? So first, thank you for, for having me. Um, uh, when I joined Twitter in, in, as a user in 2007, I had the same feeling. I, 
no one was following me, I wasn't following anyone, and I was wondering, what is this platform? And I stopped tweeting for a year, and then I came back in 2008, and since then, I've been a very active user of the platform. And as you mentioned, just 18 months ago, uh, my company was acquired by Twitter. Um, so my company, Bluefin Labs, was analyzing what people are saying on, on Twitter and Facebook in response to TV. The, the, the belief at the time was TV continues to be the most formidable media that defines a culture, that contributes to a culture, that changes a culture, and that starts conversation. But as we know, TV is one way, and the conversation continues primarily on social media. So our company, Bluefin, was looking at TV as a stimulus media and looking at Facebook and Twitter as a response media. And we're analyzing the data between those two uh, media. And what happened is that we realized more and more people are now watching TV with a second screen on their laps, whether it's a laptop, an iPad, or, or smartphones. And while they do that, some of them do email, a few of them do Facebook, a lot of them are on Twitter. The reason that they favor Twitter while they watch TV is because Twitter is a truly a live platform. If you go on Facebook, a lot of the posts are going to be uh, from yesterday and two days ago. Twitter, by definition, the way the technology works, the tweets are going to uh, appear on the timeline based on the recency of the tweet. So Twitter being a truly live platform, people started to be on Twitter while they were watching TV. A few of them were tweeting. A lot of them were just reading tweets about the TV shows. So we started to analyze that data and since then, the past two years, we've been working with TV networks on one side and the rating companies on the other side, Nielsen in the US, Cantar for Europe, uh, Ibope for Brazil, to really understand how the data can contribute to TV networks selling their content and for advertisers to understand which shows have the highest correlation or affinity with the audience. So I don't know if how many of you are on Twitter, but there's a hashtag called BFF. Anybody knows hashtag BFF? Yes? What is it? Best fun forever. So more and more I'm saying that Twitter and TV are hashtag BFF. And, and just, you say you're working with networks. Uh, other than pr uh, people providing feedback to each other through Twitter, how are broadcasters beginning to think about incorporating Twitter when they create programs? So TV networks, seeing that a lot of people were on Twitter, started to basically integrate Twitter into their show. So we see that with uh, uh, award shows. Uh, anybody, the Ellen Selfie? Uh, you remember the Ellen Selfie during the Oscars? Uh, Four billion people in the world. So that selfie. Um, but also, in the reality shows, a lot of the voting or some of the activations are uh, using Twitter. Uh, CNN and other news networks are putting tweets at the bottom of their screen. So TV networks are more and more interested by, obviously, the one-way communication they can provide, but also integrating the response that they see on social networks to make their content much more live, much more robust, much more in sync with their audiences. So we've seen a lot of TV networks integrating Twitter content on their shows. The second thing that we see is Nielsen did an analysis in the US that shows that Twitter buzz around TV shows actually increase the tune-in of the shows, the actual rating of the shows. They basically came out with a study that shows that 30% of TV shows have seen an increase in their ratings thanks to Twitter. That's really interesting. We actually believe that not too far from now, the five of us will be able to watch a show together in five different places and through Twitter have a closed network and be able to share and it'll appear at the bottom of the screen. Let's move on uh, to, uh, to your left, to Ralph Rivera. Ralph is the director of Future Media at the BBC. Of course, when we think of stodgy television, we think of the BBC. So oh. we hope you know <laughs> you're going to show us why that's a stereotype and not true. 
and that future media and BBC are not oxymorons, morons, and I don't think they are, Ralph describes himself as the American engineer in the land of British storytellers. He's responsible for all of the BBC's online products and distribution. He also has a background where he was present at the creation of one of the classic uh, internet companies, AOL, for the first 10 years. So Ralph, let's start looking a little bit at what the BBC does, and I think they're not actually very stodgy. And let's talk about the Olympics in 2012, which many people said were one of the really first digital events. And it was in your, your city. What did you do during the Olympics in 2012, and what did you learn? Yeah. And what went right and what went wrong? The, the Olympics is the reason I went to the BBC in 2010 was to get ready for that event. And the ambition was over the top. It was a generational event to be the host city, host nation for the Olympics. And obviously the BBC uh, needed to take it to another level. So the ambition was there. And for us, what that translated to is the notion of never miss a moment. The idea that actually the majority of people in the UK would not get a ticket to the Olympics, but through the BBC, everyone would get a ticket, not miss a moment. So the, what that translated to was all of the video, live and on demand, all of the data in real time for every athlete, event, and country, on all the networks, on all devices, laptop, connected TVs, mobile phones, and, and tablets. And that had never been done before. Right after the Olympics, we won awards saying it was uh, the first truly digital Olympics. It helped that NBC decided to hold back the 100 meters, uh, saving it for prime time. And so obviously we didn't do that. And on Twitter, uh, that was recognized very quickly. And it was a truly exceptional moment. That was 2012. Everything that was exceptional about that is business as usual now. Our audiences now expect to get all of the courts on Wimbledon. They expect to get all of the stages in a music festival. We have a Glastonbury Music Festival where we have six stages. On TV, we used to do one stage and maybe shots to other stages. Now it's all of the stages. If we don't do that, there's a complaint. And so, uh, and then uh, video on mobile. Going into 2012, we had iPlayer. Uh, so we've been over the top for quite some time, but we only delivered via um, Wi-Fi. We would not deliver via 3G. Our usage is so large, we were concerned that we would have a negative impact on uh, infrastructure. And but, but we started delivering on 3G. Now 3G mobile consumption of video is just standard. And we have flipped the traffic equation. So the majority of our traffic is now non-PC traffic. The majority is mobile and tablet and, traffic. And since your viewers like to eat, work, and maybe even occasionally sleep, how much of the Olympics did they actually view? Oh, a tremendous uh, uh, amount. I don't have the stats off of my head. But one of the key things that we established is that providing all of the streams online did not cannibalize the primetime audience on linear TV, which is the concern that most people have and the reason why they'll hold back certain events. And one more very quick, you have to answer in 20 seconds. Your BBC Three. I'm a New Yorker, so that's very is, hard. For I'm going to make you because I'm a New Yorker too. Your BBC <laughs> Three is going to only online. What's up with that and why? Um, we're the first broadcaster in the world that has announced plans to shut down a successful channel, broadcast channel, BBC Three, which targets our young audiences in the UK. And we're going to make it online only because? starting in the autumn. Um, partly financial 
and partly because the audience is going and is already online. And the opportunity for us is not just to deliver TV in the way that we've always delivered it, but online. It is to redefine BBC Three as a brand. So not just long form, but short form, data, a different ethos around how we well, hopefully deal with we'll that come audience. Back to that. Okay, but unfortunately we have to move on, but not unfortunately with what we're gonna get. So let's now go to Samer Abdin who is the co-founder and CEO of Istacana, which is a video-on-demand platform offering premium Arab content. He's been involved in several major startups. He comes from the Boston Consulting Group. And he has a degree in astrophysics. And very briefly, before we get into Istacana, how did a degree in astrophysics help you in your career in television, or did it? <laughs> wow. Um... Good question. Um, I guess it, uh, you know, astrophysics deals with the very big and the, oops, with the very big and the very small. Um, and uh, I guess when, you know, when you're running your own business, especially in a, in a very new region like this, you kind of have to have that balance. And I guess that's, that's, that's helped. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite geeky when it comes to the analytics and we're very strongly data driven. So, I think Good. That's, I did uh, notice when I studied astronomy, all the other problems in the world seem more minor when you realize <laughs> billions of stars and light years. So, okay, so we now have three or maybe four screens mm -hmm. that people are watching on. We've seen just with the iPhone 6 Plus now that even smartphones, and, and Samsung was ahead of them, have gotten big. So people are watching content on all of these screens. You're creating premium content. Do you care what screen people are watching on? Do you make your content any differently knowing that some people are watching on a little screen? Or do you, as long as they're paying for it, do you not care at all? And <laughs> so, to, so to be fair, we don't create content, we aggregate. Oh, just right. just an important you... distinction. Um, so, you know, we cater to as, number one, we cater to as many screens as we can, simply because that's what the, that's what the consumer wants. Now, you know, do we, do we source content with that in mind? To some degree, yes, to some degree, no. Um, what we do, however, you know, content is king. I, I think someone earlier in one of the earlier speeches said it's a king amongst kings, and I believe that quite strongly. When it comes to user interface, when it comes to discoverability, when it comes to, you know, how you interact with the platform <coughs> across different devices, that's when we start thinking about what should a tablet look like? What should the smart TV app look like? What should the desktop look like? And they're all different and they all cater to that device in different ways. But you don't actually care whether people are watching the content you aggregate on a smartphone, a tablet, a 60-inch television set? Essentially, no. I mean, there's some work that we have to do to make sure that the quality works across all those platforms. Have, have you learned which programming works best? It would seem sports undoubtedly would work best on the big screen. Have you learned which content works best on the small screen or which people are most willing to watch on the smaller screens? So, you know, the smaller screens it is more amenable to shorter uh, form content. But with us, I mean, short form for us is, is you know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, long form for us is like four hours. So, um, but honestly, there isn't that much of a difference. The, the big difference that we do see is um, in that on the smaller devices, there's a lot of browsing and discovery that happens on mobile. And there's a lot of consumption that happens on the smart TV, tablets, desktop to a certain extent, but that's, that's falling and we predict in a couple of years that'll be really not very important at all. Um, so we, th there is a different behavior across the two screens. And it also matters what time of day, right? We see a spike in mobile usage around lunchtime. We predict that's probably people at work or, or kids at school or whatever logging on and watching on their small screen. We see spikes in bigger screens in the evening. So I think it's, it's the same user watching the same content across different screens as they, as they go through their day. Okay. Um, and la our last panelist before we get into a discussion is Nart Baran, who's head of Sky News Arabia. His job is to safeguard Sky News' standard of impartial and independent, world-class news reporting. That's quite a challenge. Speak. 
Uh, he began as a television journalist in 1990 in the Middle East, where he's covered some of the biggest stories in the world, and they seem to be getting bigger and bigger in the Middle East. Um, so let's start. We've been talking a lot about the future of entertainment. What's the future of news in this digital era? Is digital a friend or an enemy or a frenemy of news? And are you an optimist or a pessimist where your world is concerned? Uh, it's definitely um, a friend. Uh, I'm not uh, pessimistic at all with uh, where the news business is going with everything that's going on around us. Um, as you said, you know, covering some of those stories in, in, the, in the 90s, that things have changed so much. Uh, it doesn't scare me um, at all. I, th I think it's a, it's a very positive way where, where the, the way the news business is going. Um, one, of the, one of the things I keep on saying is that when, when I first started in 1990 and I was in, in Iraq uh, during that war, um, I was telling my, my son, my 12-year-old son, the story, and I said to him, my parents were very, very worried. There was a big censorship on phones. You couldn't make any phone calls to your family. Uh, everything was very difficult, and, he, and everybody was very worried about where I was because I was away without any contact for days. And he said to me, couldn't you have just updated your Facebook page? You know, that, that's the easiest thing that you can do. So it's changed a lot. I think it's, it's, it's gone through uh, different phases. But I think there are four pillars of, of news which uh, are constant. And it works for us as well. And number one, if uh, you have the ability to go live, so you have to have the ability to go live. And that a news organization is always going to have that capability. So that's, that's a and pillar. The newspapers of now course. have to go live. But I mean in video. Yeah. I think people want to see, even if it's grainy, even if it's not very clear, they want to see a live, a live picture. The second thing is, is quality. And what I mean by quality, it is the quality of your content, having something different than everybody else, being able to create exclusive coverage, exclusive interviews, and that's always going to be, and having, having people on the ground, uh, 20 countries, 30 countries, uh, 30, 40 uh, roving reporters, that's always going to create a different kind of, of important content for you. The third one, which I think is, is very important, it'll always be a constant, which is speed. And if you're able to deliver content very quickly, in and in a very, um, you know, instantaneous as everything that's going on uh, around us, then you're always going to be uh, a leader in, in the news business. And the fourth one, which is relatively new, and that is interaction or interactivity with your customer or with your viewer. Uh, and that's, that's really the fourth one, which has come, come on board with social media and with everything that's going on, and the second screen and so on. So if you, if you concentrate on those four, those four pillars of being a news organization, and if you change the mindset that you are no longer a news channel, but you are a news platform, you're a news provider, and your, your customer or your, it's no longer a viewer, he's more of a, of a, a, a user of your content as not, not necessarily a, a TV viewer, changing the mindset of how you do business and how you create your content and how you distribute your content with those four pillars, if you have the ability to do all those four, you're always going to be a, a successful entity when it comes to news. And that's, and that's really where we're seeing it at the moment. And that's why, to answer your question, yes, I am very optimistic. And those four pillars are a good primer. We'll see in a minute or two, we'll look at the business models and economy and see whether you have a right to be optimistic there as well. <laughs> of course. Well, uh, so yeah. let's get in some questions. I have about five or six questions, but I would be happy if we only got through one of them and really turn this into a discussion. So these are now intended for all of us, and we can move it in whatever direction you want. Not everybody has to answer. But let's start with, as I was reimagining television for this panel, 10, 15 years ago, people said television's dead. What went right or what went wrong? So I, 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 think, I think from up front, you know, from the entertainment point of view, I think it's, it, it was quite a simplistic thing to say TV is dead, right? I mean, there's, there's all this talk about cord cutters and, and all the rest of it. There will always be a place for live TV, right? News, sports, um, first airings, premieres of all sorts. But Who that's knows a pretty how... small percentage of television. Well, it may be, but it's an important one. Um, uh, and I think, you know, uh, there's also space on the, you know, premiering something, etc. There, there are all kinds of innovations you could do. Um, where television will shift is, you know, this linear versus non-linear. It will become a lot more non-linear going forward. It may still be on the TV set, 
but how you interact with that will be radically different, I think, in 15 years. It'll be a lot about choosing what you want. It'll be a lot about your curating your own content and finding people who really curate uh, on an individual level, cu curate the content for you. JP, you're head of television strategy for Twitter, so you must really be very bullish on television as well. You know, hashtag BFF, so uh, we're never going to give up on our friendship with TV. Uh, I, I mean, I never really heard that TV was dead. I think there's a form of TV where uh, if you really reduce the definition of TV to, to a simplistic form, that is right now being a bit challenged. Um, but, uh, you know, TV is, as you said, great content, and, and, and people that produce for TV are still the best content creator uh, out there. Um, nothing beats a you know, 55 inch or 60 inch uh, TV screen to watch some genre of content. Um, even though you will see uh, teenagers watching the same content on a, on a smartphone, if you really give them the choice, they probably will see it on a 60-inch uh, uh, screen. We actually, I think, going to see more time per day of consumption of content, meaning that it's not that they are going from the TV screen to a smartphone; is they are doing TV screen, they are doing the iPad, the laptop, and they are doing the smartphone. So I think in a day we are going to see more than 24 hours of media consumption because we are going to have uh, synchronous behaviors. Um, and yeah, some, some genre, I think, are going to struggle in this linear world, and we're going to see more and more, uh, uh, either it's a DVR or on-demand shows. But as you said, a lot of the prime time, reality shows, sports, award shows. Um, one thing we are realizing at Twitter is that for some shows, we are making users, viewers, to have to watch the show live. Otherwise, you know, they are going to basically know the plot if they don't watch it live. So I actually, I'm very bullish about the future of TV, um, especially when I hear you know, people on this panel that realize that they need to evolve their business model. So we probably need a new definition of television. We're not going to get one. So I think we all have to agree it's just audio and video that YouTube's as much television as the BBC, although the BBC certainly spent a lot more time building their reputation. Moving on a little bit, and this I think we need to hear from each person, is what about business models? What have we learned about now, well into the digital movement, but still with a lot more to go, what have we learned about what people will pay? What they'll pay for news, what they'll pay for premium content, what they'll pay for Twitter, and in some of the services it supports, and the BBC is by definition in the UK non-commercial, but what are we learning about payment? And who would like to start? Sure, I'll start. I, I'm, I think uh, operating and working in the Middle East, I think we're probably a little bit luckier than, than other places that linear TV is still a, a major driver for uh, advertising uh, income. So I, I think we're always a few years behind in, in some of these things, and luckily on this one. Um, there's still TV or linear TV is still the major driver for, for advertising. But you revenue. believe that change is but coming? I think that's going to change. I think it's going to change in a, in a very drastic way. And I think if you look, if you turn the page and you go into the digital world, um, the, the power of being able to uh, sell a product to the right uh, age, the gender, the profession, the income, and what that can provide in, in the digital world in terms of uh, data and information is going to change the way that the ad advertising world um, happens in the, in the region. So it's, it's, there will be new uh, advertising models or revenue models, uh, and I think that ability to target a certain group and a certain age and, and certain gender for a, specific, a very specific product is going to be uh, the way forward. There will be a, probably a hybrid of the two uh, in the meantime while one grows. But I think in, in this part of the world, in, in the Middle East, we're a little bit behind, and I don't really see that changing drastically. So you, so you see your future of news tied largely to advertising? Uh, advertising, I mean, it depends on the model, it depends on, but uh, we personally, yes, that's a, and it's an advertising BBC model. And the BBC on the other side? Um, They're lucky. You're going to be able to count on the, uh, on the government supporting? Um, license fee supported by the people of the UK, 145K, uh, 145.50 per year, 
which I think is the best deal going, having spent my life paying $180 uh, a month for US television that maybe isn't at the same quality. And yet they uh, buy commercial television on top of that. Yeah, abs absolutely. So I, I, I'll, I'll give an insight. Uh, I used to run AOL games. And I'll, I'll give an insight fr from there that I think is appropriate online. And I, I think most people try and take their offline business model and they try and take it online. Right, so if I have a subscription business, I want a subscription business because my whole business is set up that way. I have an advertising business here, I want ads over here. And when I, when I ran games, what was beautiful about games is it didn't have an offline business model for us. It was just online. And so we had a subscription, right, AOL subscription. We also did downloads, so you paid for downloads. Uh, we also had ads, and we used to sell virtual objects uh, for your avatar, and so therefore we had microtransactions. And so I think as people start to look at what are the business models online, don't just look at how do I replicate my existing model online, look at the possibility of business models based on the fact that you're working in a medium that makes those things so possible. Is, is the BBC flexible on this issue? Uh, I described my 28 years of commercial experience before going to the non-commercial BBC. Uh, we do have... So I'll take that we, as a yes. We, we, we do have a worldwide... We, no, we, we have a worldwide subsidiary. We, uh, uh, the BBC is non-commercial because it helps with independence, being free from political and commercial influence. Worldwide, the people that are responsible for distributing strictly, uh, Doctor Who, Sherlock, Top Gear, by the way, all things that are considered non-stodgy, I, I knew I'd push back on that. It's um, fair enough. Those, those, things, those things are done on a commercial basis. Uh, those things are done on a commercial basis. And it's your that's, reputation that's stodgy, not your program. Uh, well, <laughs> I, 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 like, I like impartial, trusted, and respected uh, rather stodgy. than stodgy. <laughs> right. I'll take that. We should move it to JP. What are you oh, learning? See, this, this, this is, I am a New but Yorker. I, I, but I like <laughs> Your programming's great. That's why you have a worldwide service. JP, what are we learning about paying? So on, on the business model of TV, uh, a, a couple of thoughts I wanted to share. N number one, um, in a very simplistic way, you have agencies, you have advertisers, and you have TV networks, right? Um, the beauty of TV in most parts of the world is that you have a rating agency that basically measure the audience. And then advertisers buy that audience and pay the price based on that audience. Um, the digital world started, you know, to price based on click or actions, and a little bit on, C on CPM. When you look at the evolution of TV and video in the world, all the digital platforms are actually moving towards a business model that is the TV business model. So YouTube and Facebook are now pricing their video inventory on CPM, and there is a big push to have a rating that covers all the platforms, from TV to uh, tablet to desktop to a smartphone. There's a couple of standards in the US. There's other standards around the world. But as we evolve, we are going to see ratings that covers all the platforms. And I truly believe that the business model of TV, of paying for an audience based on the rating, is actually going to be uh, the model for all video consumption across all platforms. Which really means measurement, as we've heard throughout, has, has got to figure this out. Absolutely. I don't think Netflix uh, is counting on that model. Yeah, I would, I would say that. I mean, so let me, just, let me just add one thing. Okay, I'm talking about 95% of the revenue of TV. Sorry, there's a few percentage of subscription based, and that percentage, I grant you, will grow over time. I'm talking about the 90 to 95 percent of the TV dollars right now. You know, just one, one, uh, and to say we're right. One thing we found in the U.S. is the average American household spends 260 dollars a month on communication services that didn't exist a generation ago. 
That's mobile phones with pop penetrations even higher in the UAE. That's cable or satellite. That's broadband. So I think undoubtedly it has to be largely advertising. Samer, I'm sorry, you were going to get into this models, pay models, and sure. you're a premium service. Sure. So um, we're a subscription service, um, very much like the Spotify's and Netflix's of this world. Um, sure, I think it, it's a small percentage now, but I'd be I'd be wary of it going, you know, go, going ahead, just because it it could get to the stage where it could affect that critical mass tipping point for um, the traditional model. So I think there is some real hedging that traditional TV models, that the the traditional advertising model, sorry, has to do if it wants to protect itself against that. That's number one. Um, number two, I think globally, at least thus far, where services such as Spotify and Netflix. Um, uh, even us, although more modest than Netflix uh, for the time being, um, you know, where those services have been provided, um, consumers pay. So where there's, a, where there's a combination of convenience, of content, of ease of use, of ease of payments, um, you know, consumers are willing to pay, and they're willing to pay in fairly, you know, fairly large numbers. Um, so you know, this is something important to note, and there's going to be quite an important space for that. Netflix has obviously forged ahead in all sorts of ways and is moving across the value chain by producing its own content. Um, and let's see how that, you know, how that goes. I even heard a rumor, have any of you heard this, that Netflix is thinking of buying Spotify? Have any of you heard this? No? You want to start it. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but yeah, so you know, here in the region, as Nart said, we're, we are a little bit behind. Can I tweet um, that? Especially, go for it. Um, especially in payments. Um, you know, the, the use of credit cards, etc., is a little bit um, uh, more nascent, let's say, than it is in other uh, parts, of, uh, parts of the world. Um, there are opportunities to uh, collect payments in other non-credit card forms, such as operators, which we could talk about. Um, but, um, you know, fundamentally, the Arab consumer is just like any other consumer. So everyone's pretty bullish also on the money being there. Mm -hmm. there, there, there may be one other interesting model that's making Netflix very nervous. And that's Amazon Prime Video. And it's hard to say how much Amazon Prime Video costs. It's sort of free, considering that almost everybody buys Prime. I'd say 95 or buys it for second day shipping. And all of a sudden, you're getting a service comparable to Netflix for free. So somebody who's investing in a big business on the one hand and giving you a side benefit might be another model. I could go, I really am loving this, I could ask another 10 questions, but let's begin to get the audience into this. So uh, if you have questions to ask at a microphone, and I always respect people who go to microphones, and I can't see if there are people, but I'll come there's to you one, in a, a moment. Well, uh, oh, all right, let's start then with the microphone, if they can get one to you. Or you, or you have one, or no, you don't have one. All right, and then we'll go to the uh, online. And if it's directed at one particular person, let them know. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. OK. So two questions. One is for, I think, Jean Philip, right? Now, when you started to say that you were taking different ratings from the Nelson like and also from Twitter and so on, how do you feel when Nelson have actually um, put in an article stating that for the last month they were giving wrong TV audience, and that is actually fa the fact it's uh, affecting uh, how really Nelson was doing the rating. So that's one. Why don't we start with the one? And so I, I don't work for Nelson, <laughs> just, just yeah, to be clear. Um, and, uh, and I'm not here to defend them. Um, uh, for, for those who are not familiar, Nelson, about a month and a half ago, in the United States had to revise, it actually was Dave Poltrack at CBS who discovered the error, and they had to go back and revise their ratings and it changed. Which networks well, if, were number one if they're one your two? BFF, then you defend them. <laughs> <laughs> the TV networks are uh, our best friend, not necessarily the rating uh, uh, agencies. Um, I'm not from the Bronx, but I live in New York, so I can, I, I can take it too. Um, it's a southern part of New York with a very heavy French accent. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's uh, that's that's the risk of having one single rating company. You need one rating company for a market because if you, if you have multiple ratings, it becomes impossible to have a currency. But in this case, Nielsen, uh, you know, messed up. Uh, there's no there's no other way to to say it. Uh, the reality is, there's a very small. Uh, uh, mistake, but it's it's a mistake, and I will say Nielsen is is losing a bit of reputation right now in the U.S. as a result of that. Okay. And uh, the second question would be the way I'm. I, I was like looking into the uh, yesterday and today in terms of what we're talking about TV and the media and the way we con we consume uh, content and buying content. The bottom line that I'm getting into is that apparently. TV is not going to be a mass media, but more into an individual uh, preference uh, rather than mass. Would that really affect the TV advertising? And if it does, how would that be? I think it, I mean, I think TV will become more individual, well, more democratized in a sense. So you will be able to choose a lot more of what you see and when you see it and how you see it, rather than the more traditional model of an editor or an editorial team decide or a programming team deciding what content you see and when. Now, that coupled with a high degree of analytics, which online and various other tools give you, can actually be a huge benefit to advertisers because you can, you can start to zoom in and get extremely targeted over you know, what you're advertising to whom because you can track their behaviors, you can see what they like, what they don't like. You can do all sorts of um, very interesting things. So I think from an advertiser's point of view, this should be a, you know, quite an exciting time. And, and just as computers really leveled the playing field and made anybody able to become a publisher, now over the top has made anybody able to become a television distributor. So ju just to add one thing to, to uh, your, your answer, um, I look at the world much more as a, using the word and versus using the word or. So I, I don't think TV is, is going for mass or uh, targeted or, or, or more like personalized experience. I think it's going to be end. I think it's more about choices. But people are still going to want to share a TV experience around some genre of content. And I think, you know, if I wanted to bet some money, uh, I would put some money on the content creators that can create those experiences that you have to watch live because advertisers really need those large scale experience to launch a product, to reposition a brand. When you speak to CMOs, they are very concerned by a world where it's impossible to reach a large scale audience at once. And that's why the, the price that they are willing to pay for sports events and award shows are skyrocketing to some extent in a very irrational way because those are the only event where you can reach a large scale audience at once. That, that and instead of war is a fascinating comment. We should get that up on Twitter. Maybe you can help me with that. So a question. You're not, you're not on Twitter? I don't. Maybe you can help me get it up there, though. Uh, a question from the audience, not at the microphone. What about the receptiveness to commercial messages by type of user? We certainly know, probably by training, that older television viewers are accustomed to commercial messages. What about younger and different kinds of viewers? Good question. Probably far less. I wish it were mine. Um, it came from somebody named Anonymous. I mean, um, I don't know what, what the percentage of, I mean, let's take YouTube if we want to talk about younger viewers here. Um, I don't know what the percentage is of, um, uh, you know, how you can skip the ad after five seconds. Mm -hmm. Right, and the advertiser, I believe, only pays if uh, if uh, the ad is watched for thirty, I think, uh, or some some quite large proportion of the ad. So, I mean, that would be quite interesting. So, are you to saying that your 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 fears, younger viewers, are not as receptive? My suspicion is that, and or that they would be receptive to a different type. So, there are YouTube channels, um, Arabic ones, the U-turns, Telfaz, etc., um, or Kharabish, for instance, that do sponsored content or content that kind of mentions brands as part of the story. It's far more subtle form of advertising rather than the traditional and Let me broaden sort of the question a little bit beyond even just advertising receptiveness. All these behaviors of watching on different screens, all these things that we hear so much about millennials and what they do, is that what they're doing because they're young and have time? And when they get older and pesky things like jobs, spouses, and children get in the way, will they simply revert 
to their parents' behavior, their receptivist advertising, how they watch, or are they really transformational in how they're approaching media? Ralph, I'm sure you yeah, have some we're, we're, we're definitely looking at this because when we look at average time spent with us, um, it's about 20 hours per, per week in the UK. But if you were to de-average that into age segments, much higher the older you get, lower the younger. And therefore the question is, is there a cohort effect? Do they end up coming back? And our research people have been looking at this for a number of years. Oh God, you'll and never they, get an answer and, there. And they, they do come back to an extent, but each, each every five years, they're coming back at a lower level. So, so something so transformational it is, is it, going it, on it, slowly. Something transfer, and, and, and the thing I would say, and you know, linear TV is a habit that has been formed over generations. And so I don't, I don't think that the notion that that habit is just going to disappear like that, I don't think that's realistic because as human beings, we don't change that, that quickly. But I do think we'll reach a, a tipping point. My, my daughter is seven years old. She is not picking up a linear TV habit. So it's similar to the cord nevers. And so I do think that there's a transformation. I do think the notion of being lean forward versus lean back, I think it'll be an and uh, in, that, in that respect. But I do think that there's a fundamental shift, and it'll take time and for JP, it to play I out. Your, but will, will 70-year-olds be tweeting and 70, 80-year-olds be tweeting? I, I'm younger than that. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I thought you, you were. look good. You why, look good. Why are you peeking at me on that? <laughs> Uh, now, I just want to answer the question around the advertising. Um, um, so I think Google is, is, is like, like that. At, at Twitter, we, we, um, we give a quality score to every ad that appears on Twitter, you know, which are the promoter tweets, very small. And what we see is that the quality of the ad, the quality of the content as an ad matters. So I think there's a difference between the millennials and the older generation is that they are actually expecting much more from brands in terms of the quality of the advertisements than the older generation, which actually I think is going to be a fantastic opportunity for the creative agencies, for the, the brands and the marketers to really rethink how they produce commercials because it's not that young people don't like advertising, it's because they have put a, a bar that is much higher, both in terms of quality and in terms of the authenticity of the message. That's, that's a very hopeful thought. I think we have time for one more uh, live if, question. If I, can, I see. If I can just add, I mean. Yeah, well, as they're bringing the microphone, Nart, why don't you yeah, add just, to just that? A, I mean, they'll, it's a creative business, and they'll find creative ways of making money. I'm not worried about that. Maybe if gaming is the thing of the future, you'll start, start seeing advertising and products placement in, in, uh, in games more than, more than actual Absolutely. television. Maybe not on Call of Duty or something like that, but maybe some of the other games where you, know, you can see probably some of that product placement in, in different ways and not just in uh, But it's still going to be on screen, but it's going to be in a, in a different way. So nimbleness and flexibility. Absolutely. All right. We do have... Hi. Hi, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm Simon. I was actually anonymous that sent the question through. Um, so I'm Simon from Optima. We, do, we, tr we link uh, broadcast television to transactional solutions. Um, a couple of observations for the question. Um, uh, we really need to be pretty quick. Okay, pretty quickly. Obviously, uh, digital has aggressively gone after television ad revenues for the past few years, and television has held out quite well. Uh, also, we've got a, a great show in the UK called Gogglebox, where you watch people watching television collectively as a family, and that's become a bit of an interesting phenomenon. And finally, the, my question, which I sent through to you guys, was... We strongly believe that the type of device that people watch things on, the time of day, and who they watch it with greatly affects the receptiveness of the sit back, sit forward um, approach. And now, obviously, with dual screen, you can do both at once. Um, I certainly still watch television with my daughter in a, in a collective environment, in, a, in front of a big screen, and that has a certain, um, uh, obviously, effects compared to me watching with myself on my mobile device. And watching mobile versus tablet is different again. So I do think, 
I think I want to repose the question about environment of, and receptiveness of consumption by device, by time, by who you watch it. Okay, with. sounds like yeah. JP and Ralph. So, so yeah, I I, I I think there's this time, thing about so who wants play. to be king, right? And so content king, customer king. I like alliteration. The third C that is in the land of kings is context. And so I think what you're describing is delivering the story in the appropriate context. So a combination of content, customer, and context. So l let me uh, half answer your you question with some research we've done at, at Twitter. Again, we were looking at the synergies between TV and Twitter. Um, we took 70 people and we brought them in, into a room. And then we split them. 35 went into a separate room. They watched the same TV shows. One group of 35 people, we took their smartphone away. So they had to watch TV, basically the way I grew up watching TV, in a passive way. The other group of 35 people, we kept them, uh, we, we let them uh, watch, uh, use their smartphone, um, and they were Twitter users, so we expected that they would be uh, uh, looking at, at Twitter. And then we put sensors on their body to measure heartbeat, uh, skin conductance, which is the sweat level, um, and other biorhythm. And what we found was fascinating. Two things, from observation, we could see that the people that did not have smartphones, that you would expect be more social to one another, were basically watching TV like that, not communicating to the people next to them, and in a very passive way, and their biorhythm were fairly low. The people that we kept you know, their smartphone with them were actually more socially engaging, both through their devices, but within one another in the room, and their biorhythm were much higher. This is very important for TV networks because adrenaline drives memorization. So from an advertiser standpoint, if you can create content, from a network standpoint, if you can create content that is very enticing and more social, the user, the viewer is gonna be more active with the show. More active means more adrenaline, more adrenaline means more memorization, more memorization means more revenue for the advertiser and for the network because the ad recall, the recall of the commercial message is higher. So, so the second screen is actually creating an interesting attentiveness increase among the audience. So none of this stuff is going away. We are well out of time. I sincerely as possible say we could have used another hour. This is a great conversation. I only yeah. scratched. <laughs> Uh, you've been wonderful. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you, you to the audience thank for you. great questions. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jeff, and don't forget to hashtag.